Good morning and welcome to the Angry Astronaut. Before we get on to Starship, a quick update on what's happening with me over the course of the next week to week and a half. I'll be leaving for Colorado Springs the day after tomorrow to cover the Space Symposium. There is some new technology being rolled out by Dynetics and I've been given an opportunity to cover that exclusively. I'm um, kind of amazing. I know what it is, and it is exciting, but I'm not allowed to talk about it, so I'm going to be bringing that to you very soon. And then immediately after that wraps up on Tuesday, I'm going to be heading to Houston, and then from Houston to Boca Chica. So got a very full schedule ahead of me. Because of you guys' support, and also the support of a very generous person up in the Northeast who has given me a airline points and hotel points, I've been able to carry out not only one, but two successful trips to Boca Chica. Well, two, including the upcoming one. However, um, this next trip, uh, unexpectedly, we've got some issues. I am not going to be able to get my hotels for free as I was hoping. I kind of anticipated that, though, um, and all of that is covered. However, the rental car is also a bit of an issue, um, and it's left me in, in sort of a tight spot. Once again, if you, <laughs> this is not your problem. This is mine. If you're not in an easy position to contribute to this issue, then please don't do it and skip to here. However, if you can, I'm looking to raise about $400 to cover all the remainder of my expenses. Not a lot of money. Heck, if only you know, 1% of my subscribers gave a dollar a piece, I would be way past where I need to be. So in any event, the links are in the description if you want to contribute to that. Enough talking about my problems. Let's get on to Starship. All right, so a lot has been said about this orbital flight test, but one thing, in my opinion, hasn't really been adequately discussed, and that is what constitutes a successful test. I mean, I know what I'm going to define as a successful orbital flight test as far as the 100K challenge is concerned. Starship needs to complete a successful orbital test, that is to say, reach orbit, and then at least attempt to land in Hawaii somewhere. If they don't get anywhere near the pad or something, that's fine as long as the ship or remnants of the ship come crashing down somewhere in the Pacific in the region of where they want it to go. All of that is good. If it doesn't make it that far, that is not a completely successful test as far as the competition is concerned. But what does SpaceX regard as a successful test? If the rocket gets off the ground, I mean, and, you know, then blows up? Is that good enough? Or does it have to reach max Q? Or does it have to reach main engine cutoff? What is going to be a successful test? What should we expect from this first flight of Starship? And what happens if Starship manages to achieve everything? What happens if Starship not only manages to make it to orbit, but actually manages to land as well? So the moment of truth has finally arrived, or at least it will arrive the moment the FAA actually gives out the launch license, which at the time of this recording still hasn't happened. But that being the case, what is SpaceX really anticipating here? Well, it's very clear given the recent updates that they've made to their website that SpaceX is preparing for what they call a best case scenario and probably assuming that things may not go the 
this well, and it's interesting to see that the flight test timeline with the best case scenario does not actually include Starship landing. Instead, it has a timeline for what's going to happen up to the point that the orbiter, that is to say Starship, ignites its six engines, separates from the booster, and makes its way into orbit. There's no timeline for anything that comes after that, at least not on their website. So what does this mean? What is SpaceX actually anticipating? Well, I've got a grading system that I'm going to go ahead and lay out for you here, and that's just my opinion of how well this flight test may go depending on what happens. So what happens if Starship explodes on the pad? Fails to rise even a centimeter, just blows up. Well, in my book, this is a D minus, not an F, a D minus. And the reason for that is at least SpaceX managed to put everything together, assembled the entire stack, got the logistics in place to load the thing up, and it got to the moment of ignition before it blew up. That, at least, is a barely passing grade in my book, and the consequences are not going to be as severe as if Starship air bursts a couple hundred meters off the pad and essentially duplicates what the N1 rocket did in the early 1970s. If this happens, this unquestionably is an F. Actually, if I could award an F-, minus, I would, because the consequences of an explosion like this are going to be utterly catastrophic. Cataclysmic. N1 caused damage out to as far as 30 kilometers away from the pad, shattering windows and also hurling debris as far as 10 kilometers. If Starship does the same thing, it's going to shatter many windows throughout South Padre Island, possibly showering spectators with broken glass and also some debris may get as far as South Padre Island and also Port Isabel. Not only that, most probably the tank farm and the entire launch area will be utterly destroyed, and even Starbase may suffer some damage. This will delay the entire project tremendously. This is something we definitely don't want to see happen. So what if Starship manages to get a couple of kilometers away from the pad, not quite far enough to reach Max Q, but close, and then blows up? At that point, I give Starship a C-. minus. Not a C, but a C minus. In my opinion, a passing grade is going to be if Starship manages to make it through Max Q without blowing up. If it manages to get to that point, in other words, the moment of peak mechanical stress on the vehicle, that will be a passing grade, and I call that a C plus. Now, interestingly enough, SpaceX doesn't have too many line items besides this. For example, stage separation and then Starship ignition. So, in other words, main engine cutoff and then Starship's engines igniting to take it the rest of the way into orbit. If it manages to achieve Miko but not orbit, in my opinion, this is a B minus, a B having been achieved if the booster manages to set down roughly where it's supposed to in the ocean. If it manages to ignite the engines and reach space, well, that's an A minus in my book. That is a huge accomplishment and frankly, something that SpaceX doesn't really have laid out. Now, they do have a diagram describing what happens after all of that, but they don't seem to be seriously considering the possibility that this might happen even in its best case scenario. So if Starship manages to get all the way back to a re-entry point and doesn't manage to actually successfully set down where it's supposed to, but instead just comes somewhere close or hits the pad and blows up, something along those lines, I regard that as an A grade. And if Starship somehow manages to successfully land where it's supposed to off the coast of Hawaii and survives the landing, that's an A+, plus, an A double plus, an A triple plus, if I could give it a grade like that, accomplishing something that even the rocket gods couldn't accomplish. I really don't think SpaceX is going to pull that off, but if they manage to, it will change everything immediately in the future of private spaceflight. 
And by the way, it's interesting to note that the fellow who created this animation, Seabass, a couple of years ago, he anticipated that this would be SN25 making this flight, so he got really close on the serial number, and he also estimated that the flight would take place sometime in late 2022. Kind of amazing, but given the fact that Starship actually successfully lands, he may end up being right about the serial number that successfully successfully touches down. We'll see. By the way, please subscribe to his channel. His animations are awesome. So some of you may think that I'm being a bit too hard on SpaceX. If Starship actually manages to achieve max Q, that's going to be an amazing accomplishment and should deserve a better grade than a C plus or whatever the hell I gave it. But here's my point. Starship is not going to be a viable vehicle to take us throughout the solar system and especially to the moon until it achieves 100% reusability. Starship is going to have to stick the landing on all of its flights again and again and again before Starship is going to be in an ideal position to take astronauts to the moon after having refueled at least eight times. Now, of course, Starship doesn't actually have to take astronauts all the way to the moon for Artemis 3, but nevertheless, it does have to get out to the moon expeditiously and also affordably. It can't do that if we're crashing starships on a regular basis. These tankers are going to have to survive and they're going to have to be reused and they're going to have to be able to refuel starship fairly swiftly. In other words, eight successful launches and reuses of starship in order to completely refuel lunar starship or at least load up a propellant depot if we intend to use that in order to get to the moon, that's going to have to be achieved before Artemis 3 can be carried out. And somehow all of that is going to have to be achieved by 2026. I'm not even talking about 2025 for Artemis 3 anymore. Everybody knows that that's not going to happen. But in the next three years, Starship is going to have to somehow achieve that kind of reliability and that degree of reusability which means that this initial test, we hope, is going to go really well. I mean, we're talking about Starship at least achieving a near-complete orbit and at least trying to set down somewhere off the coast of Hawaii. That's why I've set the bar so high in order for Starship to win the 100k challenge against Vulcan Centaur, because this is the only way that Starship is going to become a viable competitor and a viable viable method for us to reach the moon, Mars, and other destinations. Just getting to space isn't enough. Wasting Starship in the process, throwing away expendable Starships is not enough. It might be good enough for deploying huge numbers of Starlink satellites because SpaceX stands to make a lot of money out of that kind of emission and could probably afford to throw away an expendable Starship in achieving that. But if we're talking about getting anywhere beyond beyond low Earth orbit, if we're talking about using Starship exactly in the manner that Elon Musk intended, well, that means Starship is going to have to hit this extremely high bar and hit it very quickly. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please don't forget those notification bells, and as always, guys, stay angry about space.